New Caledonia is an island nation in the Pacific Ocean, some 932 miles east off the coast of Australia and 1,240 miles north of New Zealand. Marais, Lifu, Ovea, and Tiga together make up the province of the Loyalty Islands, one of the three provinces in the archipelago. Unlike Grand Terre, the main island, the Loyalty Islands were never colonized and are mainly inhabited by the Canucks, the indigenous people of New Caledonia. The islands are covered with thick secondary forest. Since the end of the 19th century, they have been recognized as the property of the local Canuck authorities. It is in the heart of this forest that the fate of the Caledonian sandalwood is being played out. Jean Vaille is a Canuck and mining engineer from Les Col des Mines, a chemist and ethnobotanist who has dedicated the past decade to creating the conditions for the renaissance of a tree that was once so badly managed it almost became extinct. He believes that the sandalwood trees still growing naturally in the forests of the Loyalty Islands are a real botanical treasure, and that if managed sustainably, this natural resource could become a precious asset for the Kanak people in the future. He is checking which trees will soon be cut. That's a fine tree. Must be 40, 50 years old, given the branches I can see here. There's heartwood here. It's well protected here in the forest. Sandalwoods are small trees that can range in height from 15 to 40 feet. The bark is dark, with deep grooves running lengthwise and covered with lichen. The trunk is straight, with a diameter of 12 to 18 inches, and the branches are slender and raised. The leaves are pale green, at first thin and linear, and then become oval with age. The small flowers develop in clusters at the ends of the branches. Its fruit, or droops, are fleshy, and their pulp attracts birds, which spread the seeds through their feces, helping the natural propagation of the species. Uh, this is a young sandalwood sapling that must be three or four years old. A seed would have fallen here, brought by a bird, probably a green pigeon. The glu glu is its scientific name. It would have dropped the seed, and the seed grew. This sandalwood is in its growing phase, showing good growth. The leaves are glossy and very green, and this young sandalwood sapling is growing very well. What makes sandalwood trees different is that they are hemiparasites. The chlorophyll they contain allows them to perform photosynthesis, but during the first 10 years of their life, the roots are unable to draw the water and minerals they need to grow from the soil alone. They are equipped with ostoria that allow them to draw these elements from the roots of one or more other plants with which they grow in symbiosis. Initially, herbaceous plants can satisfy the needs of a young sandalwood. But later on, the tree must find a more long-term host, often an Acacia spirorbis, but it could also be a tree such as a guava or papaya. Because it can feed on a range of different species without harming them, sandalwoods can grow on different soil types. They flourish in both verdant valleys and on arid mountainsides. However, the young saplings are fragile and need a balanced environment. They don't like having too much light, so they use their hosts to shelter them from the sun while they are most at risk. Sandalwoods flourish in open spaces, 
That's why in deep forests, they can often be found near coconut palms, mango trees, or former fields, signifying places where humans once lived. The sandalwood that grows naturally here is Santalum ostrocaledonicum, but there are 15 or so other species, such as Santalum album or Indian sandalwood, and Santalum spicatum, native to Australia. Sandalwoods once flourished in great quantities in all tropical and temperate regions of the Pacific Ocean, from India, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia to the Juan Fernandez Islands, Australia, the Marquesas Islands, and Hawaii. In each of these environments, a different species emerged. But today, most of them are threatened with extinction because the curse of sandalwood is that it has a unique perfume that has captivated human beings since time immemorial. As far back as the year 17 BC, sandalwood was imported into ancient Egypt where it was used for embalming. There is written evidence to show that whole caravans of it were then transported from the east to Greece and Rome. Because the historical cradle of sandalwood is India. Its use here dates back to the second millennium BC. Sandalwood used to grow naturally across the whole of the subcontinent, where its fragrant wood was, from a very early date, considered to be sacred in the Buddhist and Hindu religions. Sandalwood was used for building temples or making sculptures. It was applied as a paste on the foreheads of those worshipping Krishna, and its properties made it one of the fundamentals of Ayurvedic medicine. But it was mainly used in huge quantities for incense and burned in funeral pyres as it still is today. With the growth of Buddhism, these practices spread across Asia, and the demand for exports made sandalwood a significant asset for India. So much so, that at the end of the 18th century, Tipu Sultan, the king of Mysore, decreed a royal monopoly on sandalwood, and India became the world's leading producer. It was in Madras, India, where he was born, that Christopher Sheldrake, perfume creator for Serge Lutens and Chanel, first discovered this unique note that he has used in his compositions ever since. We meet him here in Coco Chanel's apartment. My childhood was very rich in terms of all things sensorial. I was almost more Indian than I was English. I was raised in a world of spices and heat. But I have a very clear memory of wood, that sandalwood of my childhood. At home we had sculptures, religious ones, and furniture as well, all made of sandalwood. And I have a very strong memory, or a desire to smell that sandalwood of my childhood. Sandalwood also has spiritual and religious connotations. It's considered to be a sacred wood, and the smoke and odor are said to call up the spirits. I've always loved sandalwood. There's a comfort, a sensuality, a richness, and that mystical aspect to it. It speaks to us, it wakes us up. You always want to smell more of it. It's like a really good cake. You always want to smell more. In New Caledonia, Melanesian populations have always used sandalwood as a local resource. It is used for its therapeutic applications in traditional pharmacopoeia, and when chipped, the wood was used as a perfume additive for coconut oil for hair and body care. The occasional chopping down of a tree was a communal operation. Because one of the things that makes sandalwood unique is that the secret of its value is locked into the very heart of the tree. The leaves have no scent. The sandalwood scent comes from the heartwood. And you get that heartwood from adult trees. The heartwood contains the essential oil, and that's what smells so good in a sandalwood tree. 
The essential oil only develops in the roots, the trunk, and the big branches on trees that are at least 30 years old. For some species, it's best to wait until the tree is 50 or even 60 years old. But to harvest that precious hardwood, the tree must be sacrificed. The whole tree is cut up before being uprooted. The renewal cycle for this resource is thus very slow because it is wholly dependent on the natural germination of the seeds. At the rate at which the Melanesians used it, the species had all the time it needed to regenerate naturally. But during the 19th century, the constantly high price of the wood in India, combined with a growing demand from countries where the tree is not indigenous, like China, a big consumer of incense, meant that other supplies were needed. Then the Australian traders discovered that sandalwood was growing in significant quantities in the Pacific Islands. Pacific sandalwood first began to be marketed at the start of the 19th century. Sandalwood traders started coming to New Caledonia and taking the sandalwood to meet the demand of the Chinese. There was a trading system in operation, a triangular trade route, whereby the Australians would come to the islands and take the sandalwood in exchange for a few tools that were useful to local populations. And they'd trade it with the Chinese for tea, which was very popular among the Anglo-Australian community. In fewer than 30 years, more than 10,000 tons of sandalwood was exported to China. 10,000 tons in 30 years, and after that, there was no more for several hundred years. Back then, natural resources were considered to be unlimited in supply, so they just helped themselves. They simply extracted it. The way sandalwood resource from the islands was mined illustrates just how renewable does not necessarily mean inexhaustible. In 1865, there were no more trees mature enough to be used. And because the Caledonian sandalwoods were all used up, the traders went to find supplies in places other than the Pacific Islands. India then became the main supplier for a global market that, at the dawn of the 20th century, saw a new demand arising. The modern perfumery industry that was growing up in Europe had instantly adopted sandalwood as one of its key ingredients. Sandalwood is one of the base notes in the legendary Chanel No. 5. But it is also one of the foundations of Samsara by Guerlain and the Santel range by Serge Lutens, the result of their collaboration with Christopher Sheldrake. Still today, perfume creators consider it to be an indispensable ingredient in their creations. I love that musky vanilla side, the lavender base with the sandalwood. It's a very classical combination, but one that is very modern too. I can't see myself ever getting tired of sandalwood. It's difficult, it's perhaps anchored in the way perfumes are created. Sandalwood helps fix a fragrance to make it last longer on the skin. Sandalwood has that capacity to cling to fabric and an exceptional capacity to linger. Sandalwood has different effects in different situations. For example, you can use it as a keynote in a sandalwood fragrance that is woody, sweet and rounded. You can also use it in fresh notes. Imagine a floral cologne, for example, with fresh and zesty notes. Sandalwood is there every time as an ingredient that lends itself to everything and brings comfort, a reassuring note. It's certainly the most feminine woody note. It's a wood, but it's creamy. It's rich, rounded and sensual. In perfumery, there are three very important woods, sandalwood, vetiver and patchouli. 
What makes an ingredient interesting is how it combines with another, so you can never tire of an ingredient because there'll always be another combination to create. I think there's an infinite number of combinations still yet to find, and especially as we have more than 12 musical notes and more than 12 ingredients. It may seem strange or surprising to want to use the same ingredient in very different fragrances, but it's a little like with colors. There are few primary colors, but with these primary colors, you can create thousands of complex colors. In your perfumer's palette, you have hundreds of ingredients. Jasmine, rose, all the flowers you can imagine, all the spices, roots and woods. And with all these combinations, I could never run out of ideas for new combinations. The enthusiasm of perfumers at the beginning of the 20th century led to a rapid rise in the use of sandalwood in a form that had already been developed in India since antiquity, essential oil. The heartwood, with the bark and sapwood removed, is first left to dry. Then it is chopped up into tiny pieces and made into a fragment powder that provides the raw ingredient for incense. To produce the oil and extract the main odorant, the powder is distilled using water vapor. In Europe, this operation takes place on an industrial scale or in the place where the wood is grown using stills that can be very rudimentary. The extraction process can last from two to five days. It produces a pale, slightly viscous liquid, almost colorless, with a characteristic sweet, warm and woody, creamy odor. Extracting the essential oil is a relatively small business compared to all the other uses for sandalwood, but this oil will become so valuable that it will be thought of as liquid gold, making it the most profitable way to use sandalwood. In 1916, the Maharaja of Mysore realized this and created the now famous government sandalwood oil factory. The quality of the oil produced soon gained an international reputation. The essential oil of Santalum album, the species native to India, became the number one reference for perfumers and would remain that way throughout the 20th century. Each species has a different odor. And the one traditionally considered to be the best was always Indian sandalwood. Unfortunately, the other species don't have the same qualities. They're less creamy, less rounded, they can be greener or more woody. What is interesting about Indian sandalwood is its feminine side, its creaminess. But around 1990, India was hit by a disaster that nobody had wanted to imagine. We can learn a great deal from the history of Indian or white sandalwood. Indian landowners had no right to use any sandalwood. If it was growing on their property, they couldn't touch it because it was a state monopoly. Those people who could have been very good managers of this resource completely lost interest or even turned against it. Against a backdrop of poverty and corruption, a huge contraband market grew up and ripped through the last grey populations of white sandalwood. Between 1993 and 2010, production declined by a factor of 10. And in 2010, chopping down sandalwoods was forbidden by law. Indian sandalwood is now threatened with extinction. It is listed as a threatened species on the international red list, and that's a lesson to learn from, and we hope it never happens again. But while Indian sandalwood was dying out, the victim of bad management, the sandalwood of New Caledonia was starting a renaissance. 
After having been pillaged, the Melanesian islands had been largely ignored by the main commercial networks for almost a century. Thanks to this respite, in some places the sandalwoods began to reappear naturally, on the Loyalty Islands in particular. For Jean Vaiquetre, this was an opportunity for the taking. When I was thinking about setting up something on the islands, I immediately thought of a sandalwood as the only plant that could lead us to other worlds. As this species began to return, he spotted an opportunity to secure the future of this now precious resource and to use sandalwood to help reconnect the Kanak people to their land. Land is life. The land is what feeds us. It fed me, it feeds my family, it feeds my people. The whole of Marais, all the great chiefdoms of Marais feed off the land. We are linked to the land, we are linked to the tree in front of us, to the forest, to the pine tree, to the sea, to the valley, and the river. We are inextricably linked. But he has also learned the lessons of the past. In order that Caledonian sandalwood has a chance to redevelop, it is essential to accompany this renaissance by establishing sustainable cultivation practices. Sandalwood around the world is under threat. It has disappeared in India. It has gone from La Grande Terre. There are a few vestiges, but there's no more sandalwood for commercial purposes. This natural resource is not viable as it is. It needs to be replanted. It needs to be reintroduced. His plan is to use modern knowledge to help the sandalwood become re-established, giving it a boost by growing it in plantations. But sharing this bold vision of the future has not been easy. It was difficult for me. Even my Kanak brothers laughed at me when I talked about planting and reproducing sandalwood. Before I set things up, they all laughed in my face. My friend, a research colleague and the director of the lab, who said, but while you're planting, the others are earning all the cash by selling essential oil. It was difficult. He nonetheless obtained the authorization from the local authorities to set up an experimental nursery on Marais, developing cultivation techniques adapted to the botanical particularities of sandalwood. Do it, instead of talking about it. Today, germinating sandalwood, if we can germinate it naturally, that's the best way to do it. In greenhouses, the sandalwood seeds are sown at the same time as grasses that can act as a first host for the sandalwood seedlings to feed from. When the plants are 6 to 12 months old, they are transplanted next to Acacia spirorbus plants that are sufficiently dynamic and lasting to act as the definitive host. The approach in the greenhouse is all about reproducing the plants in a way that is respectful of nature. The seeds are germinated naturally and then allowed to grow naturally before being transplanted. Once the plants are big enough, they are reintroduced into nature. We don't follow the same approach as they use elsewhere in the world. They chop everything down and then plant. Our philosophy is to insert the sandalwoods back into their natural environment. It's a cultivation approach that fits with the natural environment of the islands. It's important that the development of these plantations doesn't harm the island's biodiversity. And the fragrance produced by the sandalwood essential oil is partially dependent on the plants that grow alongside the tree and which nourish it during its growth. The sandalwood saplings are therefore planted out amongst other local species in trenches or tracks marked out in the forest near to access roads so they can be regularly maintained and for ease of transport when it comes to harvesting them. Sandalwood needs maintenance and needs to be reproduced. Before chopping down a tree, you should already have 10, 15 or 20 more of the same tree planted. It's about thinking of future generations. 
It's our duty, and we should even sacrifice ourselves for it. We need to think and act so that in the future, people can live in the same experience as we do today. But Jean wanted to go further. In order for the sandalwood to become a real resource for the Canucks and to be able to create more plantations, he wanted to see a distillery opened in Marais or Lifu where they could produce high quality oils in situ. Otherwise, his fear was that the errors of the past will soon be repeated. The way sandalwood is used around the world is harmful. There is no replanting, and here in the islands, that's what we are worried about. If the sandalwood disappears here in Caledonia, and especially on the islands, I don't know what other natural raw material could ever rival or replace sandalwood. Meanwhile in Europe, the lack of Indian sandalwood is worrying perfumers and suppliers of natural raw materials are in the front line. This little-known trade is a traditional intermediary between the producers and the perfumers. They are both experts in natural products and chemists specializing in the optimization of essential oils. The Robert T. Company in Grasse supplies sandalwood to a range of clients, including Chanel. The chemist who deals with natural products is involved right at the start of the process. The perfumer uses the different elements, combining scents to please the nose as a painter uses colors to please the eye. The technician who deals with the natural products provides the perfumer with the most carefully checked and most carefully constituted natural ingredients to obtain the desired result. We can remove and get rid of those elements the perfumer doesn't like, those that present a problem for them. We can separate them out and make products that are much more concentrated, or which meet the very specific demands of certain clients. It's almost like a made-to-measure service. Sandalwood essential oil, or extract of sandalwood, is made up of a large number of chemical components. We have counted around 230, not all of which are odorous. Those which are odorous are well identified, and we know how to isolate them when we are producing essential oil or extract of sandalwood. What you mustn't believe, however, is that just because we know and understand them, we can reproduce them artificially. That is an illusion. A synthetic component stands alone, it produces an effect. Whereas a natural product is made up of an extremely complex balance of several constituents that a single synthetic molecule, however efficient it is, cannot reproduce. Nature is nature. It does things perfectly, and we cannot copy it. We imitate it from a distance, but we cannot reproduce it. And what applies to sandalwood applies to other products. Natural products are irreplaceable, that's for sure. And for Daniel Joulin, who has been researching ways to replace Indian sandalwood, there is no doubt. Of the non-album sandalwoods, New Caledonian sandalwood is the closest thing there is to Indian sandalwood. So when he heard about a Kanak engineer who believed it is possible to reboot the sandalwood industry in his country using sustainable techniques, Daniel Joulin decided to introduce him to a new distillation technique that would enable him to obtain high-quality oil at the source. The sandalwood crisis in India is what drove our friends from Robert Tay and Daniel Joulin in particular to come and meet me. He came here to New Caledonia. I appreciated that. In 2008, they tested this new cold extraction process together. When crushed, the raw material is made up of three components. There is cellulose, there's lignin, which is the main ingredient in wood, paper, pulp, etc. And there's a third ingredient, which is the essence. This procedure involves adding a solvent which only recognizes and dissolves the part that is useful to us, the essence. And when they gave the result to Christopher Sheldrake to smell, he was instantly convinced. 
In perfumery, the tradition was to use Indian sandalwood. And we got used to that very sophisticated, creamy quality. But today, with the problems we are having with the supply, there are other options. But for various reasons, there are some sources that are much more interesting than others. And in New Caledonia, we've found a product that rivals that wonderful quality of Indian sandalwood. This was the last piece in the puzzle to get the project off the ground. And in 2010, Roberté and Jean Vaguitre, with the approval of the local authorities, embarked upon their joint venture to preserve the sandalwood of New Caledonia with the creation of the Marais Distillery. The distillery uses solar energy, uses no water, and produces no residues. The improvements from using this new process compared to traditional hydro distillation is spectacular. It takes eight hours instead of three days for a much fuller extraction that produces three liters of essential oil instead of one from the same quantity of wood, and the wood isn't burned so it maintains its freshly chopped smell. What I learned in terms of extraction procedures is that with sandalwood you can extract the maximum from it. And extracting the maximum from sandalwood is profitable. And all that profitability allows me to plant more and put in place the tools that will enable me to save this species, the sandalwood species that grows here. And for Jean, this new method used at the source of the wood offers another advantage. It preserves the link between the place where the wood was grown and the people that cultivated it right through to the finished product. We all have this notion of traceability. We know where it comes from. We can follow the sandalwood right back to the wood where it was cut, ground and extracted. The oil comes out and we know where it came from, what wood was used to make it. For me, that's what makes us unusual. And the local people support the project because it adds value. We can say we know where it all comes from. This project for developing sandalwood from New Caledonia fulfills all the conditions for producing an attractive product. By that I mean innovative techniques and the high quality product this results in, thanks to the botanical species we are using, but also the societal and environmental aspect that we've really taken to great lengths there. The environmental aspect is firstly the replanting on a huge scale, much bigger than anything done up until now, which ensures the species will be maintained here, a species that is endemic to this part of the world. And secondly, the full involvement of local populations who are making a living from this activity, which is similar to their traditional activities, because these people are first and foremost farmers and peasants. So this is a traditional activity for them. Working with Roberté has also allowed them to introduce new methods that are more respectful of the raw material. To prevent trees that wouldn't produce sufficient quantities of oil from being chopped down for nothing, tests are carried out upstream to decide whether to fell them or not. Samples are taken by drilling through the bark and then carefully through the sapwood to reach the heartwood where the treasure is. A sample of this heartwood, not contaminated by the sapwood, is then removed. We take a sample weighing around one gram of product. The tree doesn't suffer at all, and if it doesn't suit our needs, we won't chop it down, and it will be left intact. We select the trees that we want and replant as a result. It's a whole new idea, a whole new conception of perfumery. For Jean, the other great satisfaction is seeing that this new industry is benefiting the Cana community and allowing young people to stay on or return to the islands. Sandalwood has brought new skills. There are young people who never studied chemistry before but who are now because of the sandalwood and they are loving it. Anna. 
We've provided work for all the youths from different districts across Marais. And we've managed to bring people in from different districts in Noumea to Marais. The distillery on Marais Island has been operational for six years now. 30 jobs have been created, and in terms of the replanting, local people are paid for planting, maintaining, and monitoring the growth of the plants for two years, which involves more than 200 people across the island. Curious to discover the natural environment that gave rise to this unique scent he uses in his creations, Christopher Sheldrake has traveled to Marais. And Jean Vaquedre was determined to make his first encounter with the tree of the sacred wood a very special one. This is the first time I've traveled so far to find out about an ingredient that is very important, but an everyday one in a way. I left Paris with a completely open mind because I had no idea what I was going to find. We walked into this deep forest along a little path for almost an hour. I've no idea how anyone can find their way around here. This walk was the first opportunity for Christopher to discover a world of natural scents that was completely new to him. That's the wild mandarin of Marais. It's really small, but it will grow. It'll become a huge tree. It'll be as tall as the sandalwood, even taller. Mm. It's amazing that a leaf should smell like the zest of a fruit. We use a lot of mandarin in our fragrances, but it usually comes from Sicily. And these leaves are used to make an essential oil that we call putty gras, mandarin putty gras. It's very fresh and it's used in colognes. What do you think of that one? Ah, it's very good. It's almost more peppery. More peppery. But it's very good. After two hours of walking in the forest, they finally arrive at their destination, a lovely sandalwood tree that is ready to be cut, which Jean spotted a few days previously. Here is a sandalwood tree, a lovely sandalwood tree, ready to be felled. This tree is between 40 to 50 years old. Okay. That's the official stamp. PIL, province of the Loyalty Islands. And now it can be felled? We can. Right. <coughs> it's normal that it doesn't smell of sandalwood now. No, that's the sapwood, the sapwood part. It smells damp, it smells of green wood. It's not the scent we're looking for. It's the heartwood that smells good. It took a long time to fell the tree. It was like a great sacred animal protected by the tribes here. And carefully, gradually, they brought the tree down to the ground. It was almost like a ceremony felling the tree. You can see that it's a wood that is very rich in oil. You can see the contrast here between the sapwood, which is oil-free, 
and the heartwood, which is very rich. It's almost wet and it smells divine. Very, very good. There, you've got the heartwood already. A perfumer, a great perfumer like that, who comes here to smell the wood freshly cut. That's something I've always dreamed of. Like that, it's fresher. It's interesting and, and fresher. I'm a little in awe of someone who can create a perfume from one of my plants, who knows how to bring out the richness of the Caledonian sandalwood. They say that hardwoods are masculine, but this is quite the opposite. This has a feminine odor. It's sensual and silky. To me, it's a treasure. It was rich, it was gold, it was magic. I was expecting something rich and viscous, but it actually had that freshness with all the rich, gustatory aspect you get with sandalwood. I'm going to keep this as a souvenir. The thing that surprises me is that this scent is normally a bass note and something very lasting. But this has a freshness when it's freshly cut. It's a very lovely scent. To come here and see their work in the forest, in the depths of the forest, where there's no vehicle access and you can barely get a donkey through, that's when you see the effort and the soul there is in fragrance. There is another olfactory surprise awaiting Christopher after his long walk back. A visit to the distillery itself. Before you enter the factory, you find yourself in this fragrant sandalwood atmosphere and you're immediately plunged into this gustatory, warm, welcoming and very sweet odor. It was very unexpected and I didn't imagine it would be like that at all. It was like walking into a kind of perfume cloud. This is typical of what we do here. You can see the origin is clearly identified on every pile. These are typical raw materials. It smells so embalmed, so fragrant here, that when you get close to the wood, you can't smell it anymore. The air is so imprinted and saturated, there's even an excess. It smells a little of caramel, there's still that gustatory note. There are piles of treasure, of gold. It's like being in Alibaba's cave. This factory is a formidable example of how they're extracting a natural product on the islands using cutting-edge technology. We can open it now that the evaporation is finished. We'll open it and collect the essence. It's a little chocolatey, there's a milkiness to it. It's almost woody, but it's not really a wood. I found it very satisfying to hear Chris describing the odors in the same way as I had interpreted them, often without really putting it into words. That was made 30 minutes ago. It smells of sandalwood. There's no other note brought about by the extraction. To me, this procedure is the one that most faithfully renders the scent of the wood. Beyond all these new arrangements of the familiar notes of his favorite ingredient, this trip to Marais has provided Christopher with a chance to discover a world that is completely new to him. 
the world of the men and women who spend their days working to ensure the renaissance of Caledonian sandalwood. To go back to the origins of my interest in perfumery, it was because I discovered that behind every natural product, there was a story. I knew that New Caledonia was near Australia, 24 hours from Paris. I knew there were traditions, that there wasn't just French law, that there was also a kind of respect that needed to be understood. But I honestly never thought I'd be part of these traditions and exchanges. That's the flower of the Pacific Islands. Exactly. Delicious. For Jean, the opportunity to have these kinds of encounters really demonstrates just how important it is for the Canucks to preserve what they see as a living heritage. For all the work you do here, the sandalwood that brings us together today, I'd like to thank the great chief and thank you all. Thank you very much. Sandalwood production goes beyond the economic aspect. Its development must serve as a tool to create connections. It is an added value for the people of the islands, but it's also a way of opening up to others. Through sandalwood, we have created a model, an economic model that links our traditional values, financial value, and the values shared by the perfumers. To me, that's what it's about. It's about the fulfillment of the Kanak people of tomorrow. And that's what's important. So far, these exchanges have led to more than 90,000 sandalwoods to be planted on Marais. But despite the enthusiasm surrounding the initial success of this unique project, Jean knows that the battle is far from won. What I'm worried about now is that this quality that has been recognized around the world will make people jealous. We're at a risk from these traders who have no scruples. They are only interested in the harvest. And now the invaders are coming. There's a Chinese community that is coming in to buy. It's the return of the sandalwood traders. In the face of this threat, the future of the Caledonian sandalwood is still unsure. Its renaissance will depend on the way it is managed over the coming decades. But if everyone respects their commitments, the sandalwood and its inimitable fragrance can continue to be enjoyed by future generations and inspire them with the values associated with it. Mankind? History? Spiritual? Divine? Environment, essential, sincerity, and sharing. <laughs>